Here we go. And this, like I said, these are brand spanking new slides made over the weekend and this morning. So this lecture might be a little rough because it's the first time I've ever given it. And let's talk about the eyes. Well, hopefully we know there's two eyes. So if you know there's two eyes, you're off to a good start. Um, they are, of course, the organ of sight that allows us humans to see. They're protected by an upper and a lower eyelid. And then we have little hairs coming out of the eyelids. Those are called eyelashes. Those are really called cilia in real strict medical terms, cilia. Let's go over the basic parts of the eye. So we have, of course, the iris. That is this blue part right here that is colored. And deep to the iris or inward to the iris, we have a round pupil. This is a hole that lets light come into the eye. The light hits the back of the retina and a pitcher is formed, and we'll talk a little bit about that if we make it that far. It is variable in size, and the size of the pupil is controlled by the width of the iris. Okay, There is a sclera, that's the white part of the eye, but the sclera goes so much further. It actually is the entire eyeball, the outer eyeball. Like if you pluck this eye out of its socket and we're like throwing it around in your hand, that's the whole sclera is the eye. So it goes much deeper than that uh, of which we can see right here. Sclera. Uh, the limbus, you may not know the limbus. So the part of the eye where the, where the iris meets the sclera is called the limbus. So this whole circular region right here is called the limbus, where the cornea meets the iris. Upper eyelids we talked about. Uh, the canthi, there's a medial and lateral canthus. So the medial canthus is the corner where the skin meets in the middle. Lateral canthus is where the skin meets in the outside here. The cornea is almost like a contact. If you wear a contact lens, the contact slips over pretty much your uh, entire iris here in pupil. Can't really see it good from this view, but there is a little capsule, clear capsule over this, and that's called the cornea. So we'll look at that a little more later. Parts here. So we have a lacrimal gland, which is in, a la uh, in the lateral part above, just above the upper eyelid. It's in a little fossa on the frontal bone. You probably saw it in your, uh, your anatomy. What was that? Reg 1 anatomy, osteology. There's a little impression or a little depression for the lacrimal gland. And that makes the watery part of tears. So there's constant you constantly have, not like you're crying, but you constantly have little tiny bits amount of water and salt and antibacterial stuff uh, that is circulating over your eye all the time. And so there has to be a way to drain that off, right? Or else we would start tearing up. And there's two little kind of manholes right here, like a manhole cover or little entrances to pipes. And those are called the punctums. We have a up upper punctum and a lower punctum and the fluid will drain into these and it drains through these canaliculi. There's a lower canaliculi and an upper canaliculi and so the tears that are constantly coming out of there are constantly being drained into this thing called the lacrimal sac and you remember there's a lacrimal sac fossa that you learned about uh, it's half between the nasal bone and the lacrimal bone. There's a depression for this lacrimal sac. And it's a tear collector. And when it fills up, it drains into the nasal lacrimal duct, which you also saw in osteology. And that drains into your nasal cavity. That's when you get emotional and you start producing lots of tears. They 
get drained into here like crazy and they just overload uh, the lacrimal sac and they're constantly draining in your your nasal cavity and you have to sniffle to kind of sniffle them up that's why you get sniffly because you have those are tears that are making you sniffly so we're just going all over these parts here and we just talked about how the tears drain out of the eye here um, there's a meaty little part here in the corner of the eye this isn't the greatest picture there it is right there you can see it that meaty part right there um, that is called the caruncle Caruncle. It just covers some sebaceous glands. It really doesn't do that much. So not, that's not super, super important for us. That's all I wanted to say about that. Uh, here's the cornea again revisited. If we look from the side, we can finally see the cornea. It really looks like a contact, but it's kind of a bubble that sits there. Uh, it's made, if we make it this far, you'll learn it's made of non-carotenized stratified squamous cells so it's kind of an interesting tissue but it doesn't have any keratin in it so therefore it's see-through and it's really important it's because we know there's a lens behind there or maybe you don't but there's also a lens we have to talk about but the cornea is actually where most of the refraction power of the eye comes from because remember you have light waves coming in and then those light waves have to be bent and focused on the back of your eye, a place called the retina. So most people think the lens is what does that. The lens is more for fine-tuning. But this cornea is really important for focusing or refracting, it's called. Refracting the light. That should be refraction, not fraction. So 80% 80 80 of the refraction power of the eye is actually this cornea right here. Oh, there's refraction correct right there so it's a bending of the incoming light so that it focuses perfectly on the back part of the eye which is called the retina and so here's a little cartoon of that if you look at a stop sign there's light being reflected off the stop sign in the light which is in the form of photons the photons uh, are captured through the cornea but they have to be bent so they hit the back of the eye, which is called the retina, just perfectly. And so your cornea does that. Here's the lens. The lens helps uh, do that, but it's more for fine-tuning. And we can control the thickness of the lens, as we'll learn later on. The, the stop sign is actually upside down here, the way it's, the light uh, portrays it, because the, the beams crisscross here. So key point is the cornea and the lens are responsible for bending the light, but by far the cornea is the most important. If you have a perfect cornea, you'll have really good vision typically, but some people have little waves in their cornea and it's not perfectly concave like this. And that's called the stigmatism. When you have a cornea that is not perfectly rounded, and it has little dips in it here and there, it's called an astigmatism. And people with astigmatism, they have trouble seeing up close and they have trouble seeing far away. If the light rays are not refracted or bent correctly, for example, if they're bent too much or if the eyeball is too long, maybe the cornea is working fine. But for whatever the reason, if the focus is short of the retina you have a condition called myopia and I do want you to know that myopia if you don't already uh, that's nearsighted is myopia and nearsighted means that just like it says nearsighted you can see things near but you can't see things far away I mean you can see them to various degrees depends how bad your myopia is but you have trouble seeing things in the distance on the opposite side of the coin, if the cornea is too steep and it focuses the rays of light or the photons of light into the plane of the page, so to speak, the focus point would be behind the retina. Or if the eyeball is congenitally too short, then you have a condition called hyperopia. 
hyperopia. And that means you can see, you're farsighted. You can see things far away, but you can't see up close. So it gets more complicated, but I think that's a good starting point. So when you get into the more advanced classes, you'll understand this more. The iris is complicated. We're kind of doing a little deep dive here because we have cranial nerves to talk about. And you've got to understand the iris to understand the cranial nerves. So if you look, this is a kind of a three-dimensional image of the, the iris really blown up. And you can see these little bands and streaks. Those are all muscle fiber in here. And there's actually two sets of muscle fiber. There's one that goes, and you can't really see the circular component of this one very good. That's because you have to go deeper into the plane of the page to see, see this. These are more superficial, but you can see a little kind of a ring around. It's almost like a purple color here. So those are called the sphincter pupillae muscle. Sphincter pupillae muscle, and there's a whole bunch of AKs that are going to drive you crazy. Okay. Um, the size and the contraction state of sphincter pupillae actually control the size of your pupil. So those, those are important. On the outside of sphincter pupillae, we have dilator pupillae muscles. And those are more radial, like these are, these are the real things here. Um, and they go kind of like spokes of a wheel out like this. Uh, and they do a different thing. They contract a different way. Uh, they, they are towards, they kind of connect with the sclera here. They don't connect with the pupil. You should definitely know that. The ones that connect with the pupil are the sphincter pupillae muscles. Remember the word sphincter. Uh, the word sphincter means muscle surrounding a pipe or a tube. And so this would be like your anal sphincter or your pyloric sphincter or your lower esophageal sphincter. They surround tubes. Those tubes are intestines, but it's the same type of thing. All right, let's go into the weeds on sphincter pupillae muscle now. So here's a classic representation of uh, the iris and these more, these are called concentric fibers. If you scrape that top layer off, you can see the actual muscle down here. And they're, they're like rings around there. Those are sphincter pupillae muscles. These AKAs will drive you crazy. This is what Gray's Anatomy, both Gray's Anatomy books just call them sphincter pupillae muscles. So that's probably, that's what I'll go with. But iris sphincter muscle is a common one constrictor muscles of the eye, circular muscles of the iris or eye. I mean, it'll drive you crazy when you read, read the research. But I'm sticking to sphincter pupillae muscles. Um, they're said to be concentrically arranged. Concentric means they are like circularly arranged here. And they're found on the inner part of the iris. Um, its function, what does it do? Well, its job is to control the size of the pupil. And that's really important, kind of like a camera that your aperture lets the amount of light in the camera to hit the photo sensor. It's the same principle here. You have to have just the right intensity of light hitting the back of the eye to make things work. Great technology day, my mouse. It's still changing the slides, but it looks like oh, my mouse has now stopped working. Now. Back, gremlins today. Um, anyway, so that's what the pupil does. Um, yep, so they make up part of the iris. We said they're more circular in nature. And when they contract, they narrow the pupil. So when they contract, this, this region right here, sphincter pupillae, thickens. And as this region thickens, the pupil gets more narrow. And you definitely need to know that word. When the pupil narrows in diameter, that's called meiosis. Meiosis. 
not to be confused with mitosis. Remember, that's div the divisions of most of the cells to replace them in your body. That's mitosis, or somatic cell division is mitosis. Or meiosis, that sex cell divisions to make gametes. So watch out for these. You know I'm going to throw these on the test to see if I can shake you up a little bit. So meiosis is different than meiosis. And unfortunately, some people call this meiosis. They pronounce it meiosis as well. That's why I always pronounce it with the E first to, to keep them separate. Okay, so pupil narrowing is called meiosis. Uh, what causes pupil narrowing? It's a contraction of sphincter pupillae muscle. That. Who controls? What are the wires that plug into this? What are the behind the scenes wires? We don't see anything from this view. But if we go inside, we can see some wires connecting to this. The wires are actually called the short ciliary nerves. They're the ones that plug in to sphincter pupillae muscle. And those are actually parasympathetic nerves. They carry parasympathetic nerve fiber. They travel down the oculomotor nerve, just like there's somatic uh, efferent nerves in here as well that control all the uh, muscles of the eye, which we'll look at. But amongst them, we have some fibers that are mixed in there, parasympathetic is, is in green here. Uh, and they go into a place called the cilia, uh, ciliary ganglia. They synapse onto these postganglionic neurons and they make up the short ciliary nerves. And those things plug in to the pupillary sphincter muscles and they make them contract. When you stimulate this green nerve, the iris or the sphincter pupillae muscles of the iris contract and the pupil gets very narrow. So increased parasympathetic stimulation contracts the sphincter pupillae muscle, which narrows the pupil, or more officially, it causes meiosis. Okay, we got that. Hopefully they've covered this stuff in, in CNS. I have no idea what goes on there, but you think they would do that before the lab. So they can let me know that later. Um, check question here. Thank you. All right. Um, so again, the oculomotor nerve not only contains motor fiber, somatic efferent motor, fi motor fiber, to the extraocular muscles, but it also contains parasympathetic fiber, which basically hitches a ride on the oculomotor nerve, goes through the ciliac ganglia, it synapses and creates new, uh, new fiber, postganglionic fiber, meaning it's after the ganglion. And those are short ciliary nerves. There's two or three of those usually. And those go through the sclera and they wrap in and plug right into the sphincter pupillae muscles. Okay, here's another, uh, oh gosh, there's a little nerd, but we got to know this. So where's the nucleus for the for cranial nerve 3? It lives in the midbrain right here. Um, and its name is really easy. It's the oculomotor nucleus. And then there's an accessory nucleus as well, but we won't worry about that right now. Uh, but that comes out, comes out of the midbrain. It goes into that the orbit of the eye through the, remember, the supraorbital fissure, and it's hidden in cranial nerve 3 here with motor signal. And then it comes here, cranial nerve 3 splits into an upper division, splits into a lower division. These divisions control some of these extraocular muscles we'll look at later. But the lower division is where those parasympathetic fibers finally pop out. Remember, they're hitching a ride on this nerve. They go into the ciliary ganglia, and then there's the short, there's three in this specimen. There's three short ciliary nerves, and they go around the eye just under the sclera, and they plug right in to the iris specifically uh, into that sphincter pupillae muscle. And they cause it, when this is stimulated, these things contract, and you have meiosis. Everybody's good with that. All right, what kind of things set it off? In other words, what kind of stimuli set off these uh, 
And when I say set off, it means causes the sphincter pupillae muscle to contract. Here's a great example. This is a direct light reflex. If you shine a bright light into someone's eye, we can see the pupil got narrow. This pupil is going to narrow too. If we give it a little time, that's called the indirect light reflex, which we'll talk about in lab. Um, but yeah, so looking at high levels of light, like where there's lots of photon, really bright light outside uh, will stimulate these sphincter pupillae muscles to contract. You could also say it's, it increases the flow of parasympathetic nerve because it's paras increased parasympathetic nerve going to those sphincter pupillae muscles that actually cause it to contract like that. A lot of different drugs and most not there's there's a whole list of these things but the big ones are opioids your patients might come on come in on these the medical doctors don't prescribe them much anymore because the opioid epidemic um, but they stop prescribing and basically you know the coaching service that I do for clients uh, I all my clients used to be on these things maybe five years ago. Everybody was on them. Now nobody's on them. Maybe in our country, nobody. Maybe overseas, somebody will be on some Vicodin or something. But they've completely stopped prescribing these. Yet the opioid crisis has not been dented, which leads me to believe it's really not the prescription of these things that's the problem. I think it's the fentanyl that's getting mixed in with kind of street drugs that's the problem. We had a student from Palmer actually die on that uh, because they party and they took something that had fentanyl mixed in with it. Very sad. So you have to be very careful nowadays. Fentanyl is incredibly powerful. But all of these are, even codeine, it's been around forever. It's not as strong as these other ones, but they all will cause meiosis or, meo, or meiosis. They'll cause pupil constriction. So the other thing we have to talk about is there's an interplay between parasympathetic flow and sympathetic flow. Like this normal pupil right here, it has a mix of parasympathetic fiber coming into it, or activated, and sympathetic fiber coming into it. Sympathetic fiber goes to that constrictor, uh, the, or goes to that uh, dilator pupillae muscle that's around the outside. We haven't come to that yet, but we'll look at that. So there's always an interplay between those. If you cut one, the other one will rule the day. And it, it's, you might as well, it's the same as turning the other one up. So you can either turn up parasympathetics to constrict the eye, or another way you can do it is turn down sympathetics. That's just like turning up parasympathetics. So any injury to the sympathetic nervous system, especially something called the superior sympathetic ganglia, and it's associated uh, ganglia and limbs. Um, there's a thing called a pancos tumor. That's a favorite buzzword. It's a cancerous lung tumor that occurs up in the apex of the lung. It loves to get that thoracocervical ganglia, sympathetic ganglia, and that can cause the pupil to get very very small. Why? Because sympathetics have been turned off. It'll also cause the eyelid to droop, as we will learn. And there goes my mouse again. And why the so injuries to the sympathetics can cause meiosis. Tiredness. This is a relatively new one. There's just a handful of research out on this. But people who get really tired, like you guys are going to be doing when you're as you're studying for Wednesday, uh, your pupils will start constricting a little bit naturally because of fatigue tends to decrease sympathetics and increases parasympathetic flow into the eye. So you can have a slight narrowing of the pupil just for mental fatigue. I guess I can't see the chat now in this setup, so you can... Just ask your questions by chat. Myself. All right, uh, what else sets it off? There's another thing we, well, some of you have learned in lab, we're behind in my lab, uh, but there's something called the accommodation reflex or the near response. When you bring a finger from far away 
right up to the nose almost and have the patient look at the finger. That's called the accommodation reflex. There's three or there's three things that happen. And one of those things is your, your pupils constrict. And normally for in class, I'd say, why does that occur? Yeah. But if you bring the finger closer, remember the finger has light bouncing off it. So if you bring the finger closer to your eyes, more light is bouncing off it. So your eyes pick that up and they have to shut down the, the pupil a little bit to prevent too much light from getting in. So you get a meiotic type response because of that. So that's what that accommodation reflex is about. The eyes also converge, they cross. Uh, that's testing cranial the nerve three motor component. And then you have to put some writing either on your finger or on a pen. I used to just use a pen with letters on it. I'd say, can you read the letters? Because that makes the lens, the ciliary body fatten up or makes the lens fatten up to read. And that's another component of cranial nerve three. And we'll get to that probably next lecture. Okay, um, so what else sets it off? We kind of said this already, but anything that knocks out sympathetics, kind of said that in the last slide, but like tumors we're talking about here. Uh, the sympathetics plug directly into the dilator pupillae, a little bit different pathway, but they still go through that, the, the cervical ganglia. There's a condition called Horner's syndrome that occurs where the per person has one fixed pupil, meaning the pupil is really, really narrow and fixed or myotic. Uh, and that happens because of a damage to the, one of the sympathetic components of the nerves. There's three limbs or parts to the, the sympathetic nerve pathway. But a common one is a pancos tumor, which is a cancerous tumor in the top of the lung, and it pushes on the thoracocervical sympathetic ganglia, and it stops the signal of sympathetics from getting through. And again, if you turn off the sympathetics, the parasympathetics are going to rule, and it's going to constrict the pupil too much in the affected eye. Okay, multiple sclerosis can damage all sympathetic nerves. Herpes zoster of the head can get it. A stroke or a syrinx, any kind of brainstem lesion can do it. There's a whole list of uh, the causes of Horner syndrome. Oh, I guess the accommodation reflex is on here, so maybe I can test you on that if I don't get to, to actually talking more about it. So the three responses for the accommodation reflex are eye convergence, where the eyes cross. You have to have the patient look at that finger. And then meiosis of both pupils because of the extra light bouncing off the finger. And then thickening of the lens. Well, how do you tell if the lens is thickened? You can't see the lens. But if the lens thickens, it allows you to read close up. So you have the patient read. And if they have glasses, then they have to wear the glasses when, they, when you do this test. or You won't be able to test this. But if they can read really close up, then the lens has gotten thick. Uh, and most likely their accommodation or the near response is okay. Ying versus Yang. Pupil size is controlled by parasympathetic and, and sympathetic input. So kind of we talked about this. Parasympathetic and sympathetic input signals are constantly bombing those two muscles of the iris. So right now as you're sitting there, you're laying down on the couch or wherever you are, in the kitchen, fixing lunch, wherever you are, you have almost an equal flow of parasympathetic and sympathetic nerve input into the, the sphincter and the dilator muscles. And so the sphincter muscles want to make the pupil smaller, the dilator muscles want to make the muscle or what the pupil bigger. And so you have kind of a happy medium which can be uh, adjusted depending on how much light is out there or any of the factors we talked about. So it's important to understand that there's these two are always influencing the size. Very similar to the lumen size of an arterial. An arterial lumen size is constantly fluctuating a little bit, but it's controlled by nitric oxide that is released by the endothelial cells. And it's also controlled 
And those nitric oxide, they want to constrict it. It's also got sympathetic input coming in all the time from the vasomotor center. So that's another yin versus yang, two, two forces always on. And if you lose one force, the other force will rule. So that's just kind of the point of that slide. Okay, so yep, so if you go in a, the, the example here, if you go in a dark room, the, sem, the, the, the sympathetics will start to rule because you need your pupil to be open. Now the retina is not getting enough light. So to fix that problem, sympathetics are turned on. And parasympathetics, they're still on, but they're kind of overrun a little bit by sympathetics. Sympathetics plug, plug into that dilator pupillae muscle, and they cause it to constrict, which pulls open the pupil. In other words, that word is called mydriasis. Mydriasis is when the pupil enlarges. Meiosis is when it constricts. So make note cards on that. Assume you know that. You probably know that already, but if you don't, make sure you do. On the opposite side of the coin, if it's really, really light, we go outside into the bright sun. Uh, there's way too much photons hitting our retina, and that will stimulate parasympathetics to be released, and they will cause your people to constrict, which is called meiosis. They'll become meiotic because of that. Okay, important concept. Knock out the sympathetic input. Parasympathetics will rule the day. So you don't have to increase parasympathetics to, to get a constrictive response of the pupil or get a meiotic response. You can decrease the sympathetics. You could also increase the parasympathetics. So that's two ways that we can constrict the pupil. We can either knock out sympathetics or we can increase parasympathetics. Same thing here to, to dilate the pupil. Mydriasis, uh, we can either knock out the parasympathetic input, that'll dilate the pupil, or we could increase the sympathetic input and that will also dilate the pupil. So make sure you guys understand that. Email me if you have questions about that. Or you can talk to me at the next lecture. You guys probably aren't going to spend much time on this, right? Because you're studying for Wednesday. Dilator, pupillae muscle. Kind of talked about it, but let's officially talk about it. So this is right here. These are the streaks, kind of more radial spokes, like spokes on a bike. Uh, and this is the makes up the outer periphery of the iris. And yep, these muscles are embedded in the outer part of the iris. And they're more, they run like the spokes of a bicycle. They're really easy to see. A whole bunch of AKAs again. Uh, iris dilator muscles are just dilator muscles of the iris. So there's a lot of sphincter muscles. I've seen that. So there's a lot of AKAs. Uh, what, is, what does this do? Well, we already know. When you contract the dilator muscle up here, it pulls open the pupil. The sphincter pupillae won't change in size, but it literally stretches the whole thing out, and it opens up the pupil, and the pupil is open. That's called mydriasis. Mydriasis. Okay, what sets off the dilator pupillae muscles? So low light environment, that'll, that'll do the trick. That stimulates sympathetic inflow and will open them up. Brain injuries can do that. Sexual arousal via the hormone oxytocin can also dilate your pupils. Even if it's light outside, they can get big and dilated. Uh, fight or flight, so a tiger jumps out. Uh, you're freaked out by something. Sympathetics turn on, pupils dilated. Parasympathetics turn on, pupils constrict. That's a softball board question. You gotta know that for sure. If you get an injury to the oculomotor nerve, well, the oculomotor nerve, that's cranial nerve three, that carries the signal of the parasympathetics. And if you injure that nerve or pinch it, you're gonna decrease parasympathetics. If you decrease parasympath parasympathetics, it's just like increasing sympathetics. 
So two ways to increase sympathetics, really increase them or decrease parasympathetics. That both increases them. Some drugs, adrenaline, cocaine, LSD, mushrooms, ecstasy, uh, antidepressants and antihistamines can all increase the pupil size. So not the opioids. So you know I'll test your knowledge and whether you know, is it the opioids? What do they do? Do they increase your pupil size or do they decrease your pupil size? So it's these drugs, the cocaine, etc., they increase the pupil size because they stimulate sympathetics. Dilator pupillas, who controls them? Well, it's that same cervical, superior cervical ganglia where is where the ganglia is. But the pathway is a little bit different. Parasympathetics actually go with the internal carotid artery. There's a plexus around that. Uh, and then they get up into the, into the trigeminal nerve or into the oculomotor nerve. This one's a little different. They get up into the trigeminal nerve. So the sympathetic fibers run in the trigeminal nerve more specifically in V1, and I, I just assume you know that's the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve. And you could get even more specific. It's the nasal ciliary nerve that really carries these sympathetic fibers. Uh, and then after it gets at about the level of the ciliary ganglia, it changes names into the not the short ciliary nerve. Remember, those are parasympathetic. Uh, it's the long ciliary nerve. Those contain sympathetic fibers and they go puncture through the sclera and they connect into the dilator pupillae muscle and cause them to contract. When they contract, they stretch that pupil way out and make it big. That's called mydriasis. Mydriasis. Still with me out there? All right, let's look at this. You should have seen this in Rege. Oh, you haven't even had Rege 2, right? You're in Rege 1. So, well, sneak peek for Rege 2. Um, you can see this on the cadavers. You can see these big bumps and then these skinny skinny nerves and big bumps. They don't look yellow like this, but there's three cervical sympathetic ganglia. This one is magical. A lot of properties, a lot of things and disease can go go on if something goes wrong with that superior. But what feeds the superior cervical ganglia is these guys down here. It's actually the signal comes out of T1, T2 neural foramen and it goes into this one right here, cervical, thorac uh, cervical thoracic ganglia, also known as the stellate ganglia. And so that, that chain goes all the way up and it synapses in the superior sympathetic ganglia. So any tumor anywhere here, you, you pinch this pipe anywhere, Pankos tumor happens right here. It fills up, this would be the apex of the lung. It just crushes the stellate ganglia here. And if you crush that, there goes your sympathetic flow. So you don't have as much flow, sympathetic flow, going to the outer part of the iris. And therefore, the inner part of the iris starts, just wins by definition, and it constricts the pupil. Okay, it also goes to, and we'll look at this in a little while, um, there's, we know about the, di the dilator pupillae, that's the one we just talked about it, but it also goes to another one called Mueller's muscle, also known as the superior tarsal muscle. That helps keep your eyelid open. So having normal sympathetic flow into your eye is really important because your eyelid stays open. People with Horner syndrome or people with these Pankos tumors, any pinching of this chain, and not only does their pupil constrict, but their eyelid droops, and that's called ptosis. Okay, so that's another one. Mueller's muscle gets paralyzed. It doesn't completely drop because the somatic portion of cranial nerve 3, that controls levator palpebrae superioris. So the muscle that holds your eyelid open is double innervated by both parasympathetic and sympathetic, I'm sorry, by sympathetics and by regular somatic motor. So it keeps it open. 
because we don't want your eyelid drooping right over your eye. So there's, it's a double system. Okay, so the entire cervical sympathetic chain carries postganglionic sympathetic fiber. Disrupt it anywhere, and it decreases the flow of sympathetic fiber into the eye. Specifically, we're talking about dilator pupillae muscle. And that muscle won't work. It'll get loose, and the inner muscles of the iris will, the sphincter pupillae will contract and cause meiosis to occur. It'll narrow the pupil. Just a little review slide. The autonom and, and we know this, right? The autonomic nervous system, uh, that is called the ANS, abbreviation for that. But remember, that's a component of the peripheral nervous system. It's a subdivision, a very important subdivision of the peripheral nervous system. Under the ANS, there's three types of nerves. There's sympathetic nerves. There's parasympathetic nerves. We've been talking about these two. But there's also enteric nerves that we will talk about, hopefully, when we talk about the GI system and talk about peristalsis. So I love to ask questions about this hierarchy. So autonomic nervous system is a subcategory of blank. Central nervous system, enteric nervous system, peripheral nervous system, there's the answer right there. So this is a good slide. After a while, I'll have a whole bunch of stars on it. But pretty cool here. So we, it just shows that we have the uh, cervical sympathetic ganglia is sending postganglionic fiber to this the the dilator muscle, dilator uh, the dilator muscles of the iris, uh, which are going to dilate when activated. Norepinephrine is the neurotransmitter. I won't make you need. I don't think you need to know that from me, but in deeper classes you probably will. And then we have the ciliary ganglia, which is right behind the eye. Remember, this one is in the neck by C2. This one's right behind the eye. Uh, that will send parasympathetic signals to the inner layer of the iris, the sphincter pupillae muscles. And when they, can, when they are stimulated, it constricts this pupil and makes it smaller. Okay, The superior ganglia... Uh, these these fibers, they also go up to the superior tars tarsal muscle and they innervate that to keep it strong so your eyelid stays open. So a good little slide, kind of a recap slide there. It's covered here, sympathetic innervation, we said this already. Everything I just said, don't need to do that one. This already parasympathetic innervation it comes from the ciliary ganglia, cranial nerve 3. It innervates sphincter pupillae muscle and ciliary muscle. We haven't talked about that yet, but that's the one that, that connects to the lens of your eye. And when it's kind of weirdly, when it's contracted, the lens relaxes and gets fatter. When, it's, when it relaxes, or when it relaxes, the lens gets longer. It's kind of contrary to what you think. But we'll come to that officially when the time comes. Here's just another kind of recap slide. So you shine bright light in somebody's eye. Uh, it activates these. See, this author called them the circular sphincter muscles. But we know they're the sphincter pupillae muscles. And it narrowed the iris, or it narrowed the pupil. Uh, and that causes meiosis. And then if it's in a dark room and there's dim light around, uh, the body senses that, and the dilator pupillae muscles get stimulated via sympathetics, and the pupil widens or becomes mydriatic. Okay. And normally there's an interplay, like right now you guys have an interplay between sympathetic and parasympathetic, and your, your pupil is just kind of hanging out. It can make small adjustments for minor lights here and there, but that's the story with that. Okay, a little bit deeper into anatomy, and I can't see my clock. I assume you want to just go straight through. Anybody want a break, or should I just keep on going straight through? I'll take a little water while you're thinking about that, if anybody's still out there. Nobody's even out there, probably. 
Oh, there's people. Some people are still hanging in there. Good to see. Let me open the chat. Straight through, straight through. All right, straight through it is. All right, so let's go a little bit deeper. Uh oh, we've got some more chatters coming. Another more straight through. So definitely straight through all the way. Oh, there's people out there still. There's a lot of people out there still. All right. Well, that's good because this is not easy stuff. All right. Um, let's go deeper. So you could say that the eye is made up of two spheres. Basically, um, they're modified, but they're kind of fused together, and we'll look at those. Uh, the cornea could be one sphere, and the sclera could be the other sphere. This is smaller, about 7% of the eye surface. Sclera is much, uh, much larger. So we got another chatter there. There's a star. I guess there is a star in here. Where's a star? I don't see a star. Oh, there's a star right there. Oh, there are a couple stars in there. Oh, there's, ugh, there's a big one. Better get my eyes checked. There's a big one right there. Yeah, so I did start to put a few slides. That means this is important. So, blank and blank are the two spheres of the eye, if you broke it down like that. Um, you could say also that the sclera and the cornea are really part of the same tissue. Because if we look at the scleras right here in purple, see how that goes around the entire eye? It gets thin. It doesn't completely stop, but it gets really thin in the back where the optic nerve passes. But the, but the sclera in purple will morph right into the cornea. So they're kind of the same tissue. Hey, let's look at some of the spaces within the eyeball. So this is a sagittal cut of the eyeball. Uh, we can see two segments. There's an anterior and posterior segment. Posterior segment is everything behind the lens. Everything behind the lens. We have a ciliary body right here. The arrow's off a little bit. This pink thing's a ciliary body. That controls your ability to read close up, read far away. It, it can make the lens skinnier, make the lens fatter. Uh, but that's anything kind of behind those two ciliary body and lens, that's the posterior segment. This posterior segment is filled with a really thick, very similar to the nucleus propulsus of a young person's disc. It's called the vitreous humor. Vitreous humor is a jelly-like substance that floats around here. That's where this fills up this posterior segment. Anterior segment's a little more difficult in a way because it has two subcomponents. So right behind the cornea, we have the anterior segment, uh, and it butts into the lens. So the space between the lens and the cornea is the anterior segment. Anterior segment has two chambers within them. There's one anterior to the iris. That's the anterior chamber. And there's one posterior to the iris, still kind of still kind of in front of the lens and the cords in the ciliary body, that's called the posterior chamber. And that's got to do with glaucoma problems, uh, pressure buildup in this chamber in particular, which you'll learn about. Uh, but that's the kind of the sagittal anatomy. Then you could say the eyeball is made up of coats or layers. If you read, uh, Corana is a opth ophthalmologist two ophthalmologists who wrote a book, really good anatomy books, using medical school. Uh, but they describe the, the eyeball is made up of three different layers or coats, AKA for layer. There's a fibrous coat, a middle coat, and an inner coat. So let's look at these coats a little bit more. And this is very cool how they did this. Uh, so here is the, the outer fibrous coat or layer right here. It's made up of the cornea and the sclera. And there's just a little tiny thin kind of that has holes poked in that. It. It's called the lamina cubrosa. It's still part of the sclera, but it's really thin. The crane the ocular uh, or the cranial nerve two goes through there. The optic nerve goes through there. But this is the outer coat. 
Then we have a middle coat or a vascular coat is a really common name for this. I don't think boards will say vascular because it tells you what it is made of. It's made of a lot of blood vessels. So that's the one right here, and it contains the iris, the ciliary body, and the choroid layer. That's the vascular layer here. And then the ones with all the nerves in it, it's called the inner coat or the nervous coat or the inner nervous tissue. Uh, and that's where all the magic is. That's where the retina is. And those contain neurons uh, and other types of cells that are able to take those photons of light coming in your eye and trans, tra kind of transform them into electrical signals and send those back to your occipital region of your brain, the visual cortex, and that part of your brain translates those messages and gives you a picture of what's going on. It's pretty amazing stuff, actually. But let's look at the fibrous coat. We kind of just said it's made of two parts. It's made of a cornea around the outside. And then the cornea clicks into the sclera, goes all the way around the back. Remember, the cornea is transparent. The sclera is not transparent. Cornea doesn't take up much space. It's about one-sixth of the size of the fibrous coat. And the sclera is by far the biggest. Five-sixths of it make up the fibrous coat. Okay, They completely encapsulate the eyeball. Okay, the sclera, we've already said this, but these are the whites of the eyes. There's a posterior and lateral portion of this. It's pretty durable and tough, and it helps maintain the shape of the eyeball. It's about one millimeter thick, uh, and anteriorly, the sclera morphs or becomes the cornea, we said. And we said the meeting place of the sclera and the cornea is called the limbus. The limbus. Um, and back here again, the lamula, lamula cribrosa, oh, I can't say that. Lamina cribrosa is part of the sclera, but it's very, very thick, and that's where the optic nerve or cranial nerve two pierces it, and that's where it enters the eyeball. Okay, uh, cranial nerves, extraocular muscles. Oh no, we're going to fall down a rabbit hole. So let's talk about the muscles of the eye. So this, uh, for my group, this will be perfect. We'll be ready for our lab next week when we go over these muscles. Uh, but you guys got to know these muscles. The boards love them, part, part two. Uh, part three loves them to test them. You just you can't get away from the eye muscles. So we have two sets of eye muscles. These are the ones that, not the, not the intrinsic, we've talked about the intrinsic ones already. Uh, those are the sphincter pupillae, dilator pupillae muscles are members of the intrinsic ones. We haven't talked about these easier muscles, and these are the big ones that attach to the sclera, and we can see those in lab. You should actually see those in reach too with your own eyes. Uh, the extraocular muscles are levator palpebrae superior. See, I even put a star on this. This is like 100 stars because I usually don't take time putting stars when I'm behind on slides. But you've got to know these extraocular muscles. Sometimes they're called the extrinsic muscles. Levator palpebrae superioris, very important. That's the other muscle that holds open your eyelid or elevates your eyelid. Remember we said that Mueller's muscle uh, also or superior tarsal muscles, aka from Mueller's muscle, that also helps. Those two muscles combine and together they elevate the eyelid. So you got double nerve innervation going in there. You got sympathetic and now you got cranial nerve 3 somatic efferent going in there as well. Lateral rectus, which is weird. All of these extraocular muscles are innervated by the ocular motor nerve, cranial nerve 3, except for two of them. Lateral rectus muscle, that's cranial nerve 6. That's called the abducens nerve. Note card all of this stuff. Uh, we'll look at the functions here in a minute. Medial rectus, back to cranial nerve 3. Superior rectus, cranial nerve 3. That elevates and abducts the eye. I have a slide in this, so we'll look at this. I think I do anyway. Inferior rectus, it also adducts the eye. Superior rectus, 
and inferectus both turn the eye inward toward the nose. That's adduction of the eye. Inferior rectus, superior rectus, simply innervated by cranial nerve 3. Superior rectus, in addition to adduction, it elevates or turns the eye upward. Inferior rectus depresses the eye or points it downward. Now we got these crazy ones, superior oblique. So that is innervated by the trochlear nerve, cranial nerve four. And this is a weird one. So it abducts the eye, so that moves the eye out. And you would think superior means it turns the eye up, but it does just the opposite. It turns the eye down, so it depresses the eyeball. It also causes an inward twisting called intorsion of the eye. In fact, that's its primary action is intorsion. We're not going to worry about primary, secondary, and tertiary. They can do that in, uh, in, P, in CNS or PNS. Uh, but it, it, does, it does turn the eye inward. So intorsion, if, we, if here's your eyeball, there's your left eye. If you stuck a little flag in it right here, like a little golf flag or... I conquered the North Pole, a little flag. It would rotate the flag superiorly. It would rotate it inward or counterclockwise. Counterclockwise. That's in torsion. Okay, extortion, it would rotate a flag planted in the, the North Pole here. It would rotate it outward. That's called extortion, and that's inferior oblique. But definitely no abduction, abduction, turn it out and down. Inferior oblique turns it out through abduction and up. Inferior, you'd think it would turn it down, but it doesn't. It turns it up. So these are commonly missed on board, so don't let them get you. All right, and here, except for levator, palpebrae, superioris, LPS is not shown here, but everything else is shown really nicely. So this is lateral rectus. Uh, and let me back up. They all attach from this common ring here. Grace calls it the common annular tendon, a.k.a. CTR, common tendinous ring. That's the attachment point for most of these extraocular muscles, but not all of them. Um, other authors call it the annulus of zin. So you, you could see any of those three words, but it's a kind of the takeoff, a common anchoring point for these extraocular muscles. So lateral erectus attaches to the lateral side of the eyeball. Nothing exciting there. Superior erectus goes from the cat, common tendinous ring, and it attaches to the superior part of the eyeball. Inferior erectus from the cat to the inferior part of the eyebrow or the eyeball. We have a medial rectus. You can just see it hiding there. It it mirrors the lateral rectus only attaches to the medial part of the eyeball. Can't see it, but it's through the plane of the page there. So those are the easy ones. Uh, the superior oblique is a little weird. So it still comes off the cat, but it goes through a little trochlea that you can see in Ridge 2. You'll see this thing. And it does like a 180 degree bend here. Or 90 degree bend. And it anchors to the top of the eyeball underneath the superior rectus. So really strange. And then we have inferior rect or inferior oblique. That one does not, and here's the board question. This one does not attach to the cat. The other ones all attach to the common tendon or endless of Zen or the cat, common tendon ring. Not inferior oblique. That attaches to the medial anterior part of the orbit of the eye. And it comes over here and kind of wraps into the lateral part uh, of the eyeball. So that the superior oblique and inferior oblique, they have those weird actions because of their weird attachments. Okay, levator palpebra superioris is right over the top of this. We'll see, I think, in the next slide. So got to know these muscles. Levator, now this is a little busier picture, but if we see on the top here, there's levator palpebra superioris. So this is skeletal muscle. This is supplied by cranial nerve 3, but the somatic efferent component of it. Remember, cranial nerve 3 has parasympathetic in there as well. So parasympathetic is going to go to the iris. So it's not involved here. It's the motor part of that. 
And then we have this weird little muscle. And then, well, let me hang on a second. So levator pill PBC pereris has a tendon, and the tendon will connect into a plate underneath your eyelid called the superior tarsal plate. Okay, so um, it's hiding underneath your eyelid. And so when this muscle contracts, it lifts this up uh, and keeps it away. When you go to sleep, this relaxes and your eyes close. Okay, there's an there's a orbital and a palpebral portion of orbicularis oculi. You'll learn as well. We won't worry about those right now. Those are more important for closing your eyelid, though. Okay, so that's levator palpebra superioris. But we also have a muscle, a smooth muscle. That's right, a smooth muscle blending in with a skeletal muscle here. And that's called Mueller's muscle or the superior tarsal muscle here. And that blends in also to the superior tarsal plate. Remember I said there's two muscles that have your eyelid lifted up. And it's that uh, Mueller's muscle is the smooth muscle component of it. And then levator palpebris superioris is the, uh, the main component of that. But remember, Mueller's muscle is not supplied by cranial nerve 3. There's Mueller's muscle right there. That is supplied by sympathetic fiber that originates from the superior cervical ganglia. Okay? So those two muscles together elevate the eyelid and your, eye, your eyelids are, well, hopefully your eyelids are elevated right now and you're not sleeping. If you're sleeping, these are relaxed. All right, so I think we got everything I wanted to say. So if you get a lesion in cranial nerve 3, maybe it's damaged, you have a tumor growing in it, maybe there's a tumor next to it smashing it, uh, Part of the circle of Willis runs right next to the oculomotor nerve. You can get an aneurysm and it can crush the, the oculomotor nerve. If you get a lesion in the nerve that goes to this muscle, just like in any muscle, it, it gets limp. It doesn't work very good. And so therefore, you get ptosis where your eyelid droops. But you won't get full ptosis because you have another muscle component right here uh, that is smooth muscle. That's Mueller's muscle. And that's controlled by sympathetics. So your eyelid will droop, but it won't completely close. Vice versa, you get a pancos tumor and you lose this component. You lose the smooth muscle component of the eyelid elevators. Your eyelid will droop, but it won't completely close because levator palpebris superioris is still alive and well. Okay, see how that for high yield board stuff right there. So hopefully we're good with that, or you will be good with that when the time comes. Um, kind of what it said. So you get a problem with the superior ganglia uh, or the thoracocervical ganglia, stellate ganglia. Anywhere in that chain that, that squishes the sympathetic signal, then you turn off sympathetics to your eye. And if you turn off sympathetics, you get what's called Horner syndrome, where your eye your pupil will constrict and your eyelid will droop because Mueller's muscle is not being supplied right. Okay. There's just a review of all the different directions here. Little guys, so make sure you know the terminology. Elevation is raising the eye up. His eye is not moving up, but Depression is moving the eye down, and the eye is mainly the iris and the pupil. A D D adduction of the eye is moving it in. A B D is moving it out, and then rotating it outward is extorsion. Rotating it the other direction inward is intorsion. Okay, so make sure you know those. Here's a weird look. This is like an A to P look. You can see the cat common tendon this ring here, and we can see all the muscles connected. Levator palpebrae superioris. Um, I believe that connects to bone and not the actual cat, but all these rectus muscles connect to the cat, and we can see inside the cat is where the optic nerve comes. Um, there is a oculomotor foramen here where a lot of these nerves are, and yeah, there's superior orbital fissure over there. And just a weird look at the cat structures. Just another, this is from Gray's Anatomy.
Just make sure you know all these directions, what they mean. We don't need to go through them again. Do let's see, where are we here? Let's get through a little more. Let's get through muscle testing. This is from Gray's Anatomy. So this is pretty intuitive except for a couple of these. So to test, if you're asked to test the medial rectus muscle, you remember medial rectus turns the eye in or ADD adducts the eye. You just have the patient turn the eye in toward the nose. It's as simple as that. And watch it to see if it can go. So there's that. Um, this is the medial part right here. And say, patient, look, turn your eyes to the left or turn your eyes to the right in this case, and the eyes go inward. Okay, so that's easy. Lateral rectus, you abduct the eye. You just turn it out. So turn the eye out. So those are easy. Superior rectus is a little bit different. So superior rectus uh, and inferior rectus, they both abduct the eye. They both move the eye in. So to test superior rectus, you have the patient look laterally. What? I thought they turned the eye in and look upward. So what does that mean? Is that an error? That's not an error. So for the rectuses, you're only going to test the elevation component of it because the abduction, it's not pure. You have lateral rectus and medial rectus also abducting the eye. So we want to take that component out of the test. How do you take out the adduction component? You adduct it. So you adduct the eye. Okay, so superior rectus, you adduct it or looked laterally, and then you test the upward looking by having them look up. Okay, so superior rectus, even it has two actions, we're only testing the main one, the more pure one, and that is elevation. So we need to take that pesky abduction out of the play by adducting the eye, if that makes sense. Inferior rectus is the same thing. Uh, we abduct the eye to take out adduction, and then we move the eye downward or depress the eye to test that component of it. Superior oblique is the same story. Superior and inferior oblique, they both turn the eye out or abduct the eye. So... We don't want to test that component of it. We want to test the downward component and the upward component. So for superior oblique, we turn the eye in to take out the abduction component of the eye and then correctly have the patient look down to test the power of that muscle. Okay, And it's weird, right? Superior oblique normally moves the eye down. Inferior oblique is the same. We turn the eye in to get rid of the a adduction component of it, and we have the patient look up. Okay, so it's a little confusing how to muscle test these, but you got to know that.